Hello, my friends, each and every one of you who are joining on right now. It's so good to see you virtually in this uh, virtual roundtable opportunity to be able to have a great discussion about fostering churches. What is that all about with Dr. Tom Rayner of Church Answers fame and uh, the many books that he's written that has helped evangelical America, the Western church, and I'm sure you and your local congregation. Well, we're going to have that conversation in just a moment before we do. We just want to welcome each and every one of you. So much going on here at the network. I don't want to take the shine away from all the announcements to come, but man, I'm excited about the webinar coming up, how to connect and reach the community referred to as LBGTQ+. And we are excited about that seminar. It's going to be coming up in Pride Month, uh, where we as evangelical Bible-believing Christians uh, have a desire to reach this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ without uh, watering down the the principles and precepts and truth about what the Bible calls sin. So it's going to be an incredible webinar. Obviously, each and every one of you as members get to join that webinar for absolutely free. We want to encourage you not only to come, but invite a friend and bring them along, somebody within your own local ministry, uh, somebody, a deacon, an associate pastor, a friend, maybe a pastor friend who might be saying, you know, I really have a heart for this community, but I'm not sure how to reach them with the gospel. Definitely invite them. Uh, but a special welcome to each and every one. We are glad to have you here. I'm looking to see if Jeremy is uh, on yet. Uh, thankful for the vice president of the Idea Network as it relates to the initiatives in which we have. Is Jeremy on? I don't see him yet. If not, I'm going to throw. Okay, Jeremy. Jeremy, if you'll go ahead and take over from here and, and go to prayer. Hey, Josh. Good to see you. Good to see all you hey, guys. Jeremy. Hey, Steve Miller, great plug for the membership today. Thank you for that. We appreciate you uh, doing that for us and using your influence to help with the network. And uh, I'm going to ask that you, uh, you pray for us. Would you do that today? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, let me pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this uh, time together. Lord, we thank you for these, um, these leaders. Lord, thank you for how you're working in the different ways in our ministries and churches and uh, Father, I pray that uh, as we learn together again this week, that you would just help us, Lord, to grow, uh, Lord, through your grace. Uh, Lord, help us, Lord, to be teachable and open to how you are leading us as we lead the works that you uh, have for us. And Father, I pray that you would just give us wisdom, bless, Lord, not only the, the general time, but Lord, also the breakouts. And uh, God, thank you, Lord, for this group today. Father, bless us as we meet. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, glad you guys are with us today on the call. We still got guys coming in. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your Tuesday. I know May can be a really busy month for all of our ministries, but thanks for taking time uh, to be with us on the call today. Uh, before we get into our topic, I did want to remind you about the LGBTQ webinar. If you are not registered, register for that as a member. You can do that for free. Uh, if you know of other people that would benefit from it, I think it's a discounted rate that you could get them in. Uh, go on our website and go on our uh, page to do that and get them registered. That's going to be coming up in the month of June, and we're really excited about that. Uh, we're going to go live here to Dr. Tom Rayner of churchanswers.org. We're going to uh, really, we're uh, privileged to have him with us today. One of the things we're going to do a little bit differently today is instead of breaking out into sessions, I think we're just going to stay live and do some live Q&A with Dr. Rayner. So if you've got a question, uh, that you would want answered as he's speaking. Uh, write it down, throw it into the chat, and we'll just kind of moderate some general Q&A for all of us here uh, in the room today. But Dr. Rayner, thanks for sharing your time with us. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you. Always great to be with the Idea Network gang and uh, this information that uh, I'm going to be sharing with you is in some ways new, in some ways not, and always important because it's all about the Great Commission. And it's the whole idea of fostering, but it's not fostering an individual, it's fostering a church. Let me give you a little bit of background of where we began this journey of uh, helping churches to understand the whole idea of fostering. First of all, definitions might be in order. Uh, most of you are very familiar with the word revitalization. Church revitalization refers to an internal, uh, uh, internal movement of a church getting healthy. So you use your own resources, your own people. Uh, you, you do everything you can to turn a church in the right direction and a gospel direction 
uh, but you're using your own resources. And that's it's called revitalization. Revitalization, of course, simply means to live again. And that probably has the most, um, at, at least at this time, the most attention. Uh, I was trying to reach over here. Uh, son Sam wrote this new book called The Church Revitalization Checklist. It has become the primer for, for uh, church revitalization. It's brand new. I'm very proud of him. And it's part of our partnership with Tyndale. It's the Tyndale Church Answers Publishing. This has about as much information as you would want to get started if you want to look at church revitalization. That is not our purpose, though, today. Our purpose is to talk about fostering church revitalization, okay, internal resources to get our churches healthier. Then there's another word that has come into play. Uh, we call it adoption. And again, not referring to a biological adoption, but a church adoption. And adoption is when a healthier church brings a less healthy church in the family. We like the nomenclature adoption. And again, Sam coined that word for what was called replant or acquisition or merger with one, one church becoming the dominant church or the owner church in it. He, he said, really, what is happening in the most healthy way is when a church that is healthy brings another church into its family. The healthy church becomes the controlling church, becomes the owner of the assets, but at the same time, they welcome another church into the family. Adoption has been manifest in multiple sites where a church will adopt another church and they'll become a site of the church that is doing the adopting. It has been a way to keep churches from closing the doors. It's been a way to uh, help churches return to health, and they may have been desperate otherwise if they had not done that. So adoption is another one of those phrases. So if revitalization is turning a church toward health with internal resources, Adoption is turning a church toward health with external resources. You are actually being acquired or adopted by another church. It's one of the fastest growing movements. It was, it was growing extremely fast pre-pandemic, and now it is growing rapidly in this uh, post-COVID era, or at least the post-quarantine era, if you still have COVID in your area. So we got those two words. Now, there's a third word. And where does this one come from? Fostering. Fostering is a, is a term that I coined. It is not a new concept, but it is in line with the idea of church adoption, where church adoption is one church bringing another church into the family. Church fostering is helping a church get healthier temporarily without bringing it into the family. So th think of the fostering relationship. Uh, I've, I referred to my son, Sam, my oldest of three sons. Sam has fostered, he and Aaron have fostered several children. Uh, one of them, they ended up adopting. And it started off as a fostering relationship. But the goal of fostering, at least in the state of Florida, the ultimate goal is to reunify them with their family, with their biological family. It did not work out uh, because of many tragic situations. So Sam and Aaron ended up adopting Dominic. Well, fostering is where you, it's very simple. It's a healthy church helping a less healthy church, a healthy church helping a less healthy church. It may lead to adoption, but that's not the original intent. The original intent is to return it to its God-given great commission, great commandment health. We are seeing now a lot of intentionality with fostering. Um, I want to give you the example. I've, I've brought Sam into the spotlight on this, and I'm going to continue to bring him and his church into the spotlight just for illustrative purposes. Sam's church, uh, not too long ago, maybe three years ago, uh, started helping another church in the area of Bradenton, Florida, where his church, West Bradenton, is. And they, they came to Sam's church, and they said, we're down to eight or nine people. We no longer have a pastor or a preacher. We don't have a worship leader. And basically, we've got a few people that are well, close to death in their age. They're very elderly. But we have a building. We're in the middle of a vibrant but changing neighborhood. And we have some money in the bank. Uh, we don't just want to close it and say there's no hope. Can you help us? 
Sam and his team said yes. And so they provided, they, they have a, a mentoring or an intern program. They provided a preacher to go and preach every Sunday. In that intern program, they had a worship leader. So they had the worship leader to go every Sunday. And in that internship program, they had a children's minister. And they, they moved that person there temporarily. And the whole idea was to get the church back to health by helping them for a season. Sam was very clear as he went into this now called fostering relationship that they would only do so for a year. And after a year, they would leave. Now, why is that? The, the reason that they did that is because when you begin to foster someone or a church, dependency can set in. And so when you have a determined or predetermined culmination date of the foster relationship, it is a reminder that the church is supposed to get healthy. It's not simply supposed to depend upon another church. The other church helps it and instructs it. It equips it. It shows it. It may provide some resources. But when it's all said and done, the fostered church is supposed to be on its own. Now, that's, that's, that's the whole idea behind fostering. And what I love about the fostering movement that is taking place, we are now seeing some churches that are in dire straits reaching out to other churches and say, can you take us under your wings for a season? And they're basically saying, can you foster us? And then we're seeing some healthy churches say, hey, going to a, maybe pastor to pastor, or pastor of a healthy church, going to a pastor of a less healthy church saying, hey, can we help you in any way? Is there anything we can do for you? That becomes a fostering relationship and it's growing and it's really growing because it is now intentional where it was incidental. And so in the midst of all of this, we have all of these churches that are being helped, and it's really beginning to become a movement. What we are seeing is what happened in Sam's story at Southside. At Southside, at about eight to nine months into the relationship, the members of Southside told Sam's church, West Bradenton, we really just want to be a part of your family. We want to be a part of the West Bradenton family. Will you just take us in? And so to use the nomenclature we have been using, this fostering, foster church asked to become adopted. And that happened sometime. It was not the original design of the plan. It was not the contract, if you will. It was an email of intention. It was not the original plan, but they did end up adopting them. And now Southside Church is a second campus, a second site of West Bradenton. And it is, it is in a strategic location because it is in a neighborhood that is largely transitioned to, from, from Anglo to Hispanic. And then there also is a significant homeless and heroin presence in that neighborhood that is not just related to the Hispanic community, but uh, others as well. And Sam's church was already ministering to that community, but they had to go elsewhere to minister to that community. So it was a perfect complement one to another where one church adopted another. Uh, the, the church at Southside that had seven or eight people is now a church running about 50 or 60. And most of the, the people from the Bradenton church have returned back to their home church, but it is still now a part of the West Bradenton Church. So that's the idea of adoption. Now, but I want to I want to pause in just a moment and see see where you and Josh or any of y'all want to go with this. But I want to answer the question: Why? Why is this taking place? Well, it's basically asking the question: Why is revitalization becoming so popular? Why is adoption or acquisition or merger becoming more on the forefront? And why is fostering doing so? Well, in the Western church, we're facing a stark reality. And this stark reality is this. And when Western, I'm primarily referring to North America, Canada, and the U.S., but it, it could be some European churches as well included in this. But for our sake, it's our context. 90.3% of leaders surveyed by church answers 90.3% of leaders surveyed by church answers in the United States and Canada said their church needed some type of significant revitalization. 
Now, just pause for a moment. These are churches, church leaders that are self-identifying that they need significant help. Whether they internally do it or externally bring it in, they need significant help. Uh, I've been doing this similar type of ministry as a, as a man about to approach 67 years old. I've been doing this well over 30 years, and I can tell you I have never seen anything like this in my life. And it is both a tragedy and an opportunity. It is an opportunity to, to just put aside all the junk that we do in our churches sometime and to use a worn out cliche to make the main things the main thing. So one of the whys behind this is 90.3% of churches say they need something. They need help, or church leaders, I should say. Secondly, COVID has accelerated and exacerbated the need. COVID did not cause the problems in our churches. They exposed them. They exaggerated and they exacerbated them. They did not cause them. So if a church was in decline and COVID comes along, it's probably going to be in more severe decline. So COVID just made the issue even more apparent. It, it, it basically took a timeline. If you could imagine taking a timeline like this and ripping out five years or four years and just say right now is 2027. That's where we are in terms of had there been no COVID. We're five years further into the future than we would have been. And that means if we were declining, we've added five years to our decline without the five years actually transpiring. So COVID is part of the reason. Another reason is that in the vast majority of churches, evangelism is not a priority. I do know that in many of the independent Baptist churches, it is a higher priority than it is in other churches. And for that, I'm very grateful. But in the vast majority of churches across the nation, evangelism is not a priority. Let me, get, let me just give you a little bit of a story on this. And, and, and by the way, um, what time am I supposed to shut up so I can take questions? We've got time. You've got at least seven to 10 more minutes if you want to continue on. Okay. Well, so if I finish at uh, one, uh, two, two, whatever time it is, okay, my time is one twenty, uh, about five or six minutes. Yeah, that's okay. great. You're not dragging at all. You're, you're great. Stay, we're, we're with you. I know I'm not dragging, but I just don't want to keep people. So I, I, want, I want to make sure I'm since I want to be sure I'm sensitive to time. Thank you. So um, let, 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 let me just, let me go on to this example that I was going to give you. We're doing a consultation of a, of a church. Uh, it's denominational, but it's not Baptist. And I'll just leave it at that in Texas. And as we interviewed individuals for this consultation, we not only found out that 0% of the members were doing evangelism, and I did say zero, we found out that about three out of four of them did not even know what evangelism was. And, you know, the church wanted to know why it's not growing. I said, well, probably you're not growing because you're not reaching people with the gospel because you don't know what the gospel is and you're not trying to reach people. If that sounds like an absurd illustration, it's actually more of a normative uh, illustration. I'm going to put one other point on here. I had several I could do, but I got to take up too much time and it may come up in the questions. Here, here's, here's another point. The, the, the many churches do not know their community. I heard y'all talking about a webinar uh, where you're talking about reaching a community that has been largely foreign to uh, most evangelical churches. And we're trying to understand this community, of course, not to compromise, but to reach them with the gospel. But most churches do not know their community. I want to go back to that church we're consulting in Texas. And this will be my last point um, about a church not knowing its community. This church uh, financially healthy, um, building in great shape, declining, and the membership, like in many churches, is getting older. In fact, the median age in this particular church was close to 70 years old, and they didn't have a lot on the other, on the younger side of 70 uh, to bring the average age down that much. They had a perception, they had a perception that their church was in a predominantly senior adult demographic. Well, we did a study 
uh, we, we, we have this study that we do called Know Your Community. And we did a study of a 15 minute drive. We believe drive time is the most important way to do this. We did a study of a 15 minute drive time. And I wanna show you the primary segment uh, that made up the population within a 15 minute drive. Now this is dangerous because I'm gonna go to screen share and let's just see if I can do this for just, a, oh, I'm disabled. I'm not gonna even try it. So uh, don't even worry about enabling me because I'd probably mess it up every time I go to screen share anyway. I was gonna show you the, the, the dominant segment, the characteristics that were there, but, but, but he, here, here's the point. That particular segment that was dominant, it made up about 20% of the population. It was the number one segment of all of them. Had a median age in the 40s, families with children, uh, anything but a senior adult population, and they did not know it. When we meet with church leaders and we say, this is your community, just from a data, a demographic point of view, inevitably, almost unanimously, but inevitably, pastors are surprised. Another quick example, um, we were meeting with what we call a micro consultation where we get 10 to 12 pastors together uh, in a room for two days and just look at their churches in great detail. And one of the things we did is we got the Know Your Community reports and we said, okay, spend an hour looking at your report. Come back and tell us what you see. The first person that started speaking to us started crying. And this was not a normally emotional pastor. And his comment was, the dominant demographic segment in our community are single mothers. And we don't have any way that we're trying to reach single mothers. And he said, we, we, we've had this field that is, that is there for the harvest and we have not even tried to reach them. And so I could go on and on, ladies and gentlemen, about the, 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 all the reasons that we are where we are today, but the primary issue is that fostering is becoming one of those incredible ways, incredible ways that churches are beginning to help other churches get healthy. And here's the thing about it. In our study of the fostering churches, we have found that when the church that is doing the fostering supposed to be the healthier church. When the church is doing the fostering, then that church becomes healthier. And by that, I mean more evangelistic, more growth, deeper discipleship, and everything that you would define as healthier. So not only does it help the church that is healthy, unhealthy, but it helps the church that is healthy as well to get healthier. Passage that we read in our church to wrap this up, every Sunday at the conclusion. Uh, it comes from Matthew 9, beginning in verse 36. You know this verse. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. For two decades straight, we have been studying the receptivity of lost people to the gospel, and the receptivity is high. Only 5% are antagonistic towards someone sharing the gospel with them or even on a lower key inviting them to church. One of the big reasons that we have so many unhealthy churches right now is we are perceiving that there's not a harvest field that is out there. But the words of our Lord said it 2,000 years ago, and it's still true in 2022. Fostering is just one of those ways, but we think it's an incredible way to reach people with the gospel. I'll wrap it up there. We could probably go in a lot of different directions, but I'll pause for right now. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Rayner. Um, any questions that you guys have got while we have him? I appreciate his time and the work that has gone into all this research. Any, any of you guys want to Throw your hand up, just unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Steve, you look like you got something you want to say, man. Go for it. I do. I have a question. Thank you, Dr. Rayner, for this information. So you mentioned a couple of times where a church approached, an unhealthy church approached a healthy church. Could you give maybe some best practices or some context when it's appropriate or the way for a healthy church to approach an unhealthy church, because that would be the context that we're kind of in right now. 
uh, where there's a couple of churches I've been looking at, and I'm just not sure how to approach them. And my, I guess the second part of my question would be, when you do approach them, are you trying to help them implement things that you would want to see the church do, or are you trying to help them implement things that they want to see happen? That would be the, my question. First part of the question is relationships, relationships, relationships. If you really want to help churches in presuming that the church has a pastor in place, you as a pastor or leader of your church need to start spending time with that pastor. You need to start getting to know him, having coffee with him, taking him out to eat and just saying, I want to get to know you. And um, you, you may do that with two or three or four pastors of these churches. Inevitably, relationships are going to lead to discussions. Discussions are going to talk about the church. And inevitably, that pastor or you are going to say at some point, can we do anything for you? How can we help you? And it may, he may just say, pray for us. And that's all we need. Well, do you need any resources? Do you need this or that? If you are in a healthy relationship with pastors in these churches, they are hurting. They need to know that someone cares about them. They need to know that there's help out there. And if you're, if you're in a relationship, just coffee, meals, and time with these pastors, I can give you a high level of confidence that if you do this with three or four pastors, it'll only be about three, three, three to six months before some type of fostering relationship begins. So don't force it. Let it be relational, relational. And what you may find is there may be the request not for a fostering, but for an adoption. But fostering is less threatening to most pastors because all you're doing is offering to help. You're, you're not offering what they may perceive to be a hostile takeover, uh, which is sometimes the perception of the ad adoption relationship. Uh, give me a quick review of the second part of your question. I'm old and I forget anything that's longer than 45 seconds. <laughs> totally fine. So when, let's say they do open up and say, we'd like for you to come and foster us and that would be great. As the healthy church, are you trying to change their culture or implement things that would help them become healthier? I remember the question now. Okay. What you're trying to do, and without, without trying to be flippant, is none of the above. What you, you're not trying to do what they want to do, and you're not trying to do what you want to do. You want to, you're, what you're trying to do is what the community, what the community God has placed them in dictates. And that, not, that, not that context has more power than scripture, but context tells us how the scripture may end up playing out in that context. So one of the first things I would do if I'm fostering a church, I would get one of those demographic psychographic reports and just find out what their community is. Say, so let's start off by finding who, who is here. And, and uh, uh, Josh, I'm going to just give a quick plug of ours because ours is the, the one that I like the best. So if you don't mind me doing that one, uh, uh, just, just go to churchanswers.com and click on demographic reports or click on know your community. And it's about a 40 page insight into what is in that community. We use, we recommend using drive time. So that's, that's one way to do it. But I would start off with who is here to reap? God has put us in a harvest field. Who is there? That's going to determine the, the what we do next. And it may not be what you want, and it may not be what the church wants, but it may be what God has placed there. Every church has an address for a reason. There's no accident. And the church you're fostering has an address for a reason. So find out what that might be. Great question, Steve. Uh, who else? Who else wants to jump in here with a question? Yeah, Justin, I see you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, is there a church size recommendation that you would have just based off of some of your historical trends before you would even consider um, looking into fostering another church? The median size of churches today, and let's, let's differentiate between median and average. Average is when you add up all of the number of churches and their attendance and then divide it by the number of churches. That's not the best measure to do it because it can be skewed. Uh, the best way to do it is median, and that means half of churches are below this size 
and half of churches are above the size. The median size of a church in the United States is a worship attendance of 60. So if you have an attendance of 61, you're in the top 50% of churches in America. Uh, I, I believe that you can get down as low as 20 or 30 especially in some rural or small town areas and be relatively healthy and still foster another church. And here's the thing about it is your small church, very small, in some cases will actually start benefiting by helping that church. I'd actually did that in my first pastorate is probably oh, about two and a half centuries ago when I had my first pastorate, but the, the attendance was seven when I started uh, my family of five joined the church, and so we bragged to everybody that we had an increase in attendance of 43% in one week. Our little church began to foster another church. I had no idea that we were fostering another church. We just began to help it. Doing so helped our church become more great commission-minded, more evangelistic. So there are very few barriers about size. You can have an unhealthy 1,000 attendance church, and you can have a healthy 40 attendance church. So the key to me is more the health than the absolute size. Good question. What else? I saw a hand a minute ago and then it went down. I had raised my hand, but you kind of answered the question right there at the end. My question was that, do you consider fostering as part of the process of becoming healthy yourself? Um, you know, as, as we're looking to revitalize our own churches and we're going through that process of doing things that, that cause us to become healthier, is this something to consider? But you kind of answered it there towards the end. I'll, I'll just be a little more emphatic about it, and I'll say absolutely. Um, many of our churches have become inwardly focused. We're focused on taking care of our own, doing our own thing, and meeting our own preferences and desires. And while pastoral ministry definitely needs to take care of our own members, what we have done so quite often is that the neglect of an outward focus. Uh, I use those two words repeatedly, and I know that oftentimes people just kind of uh, nod their head in affirmation like they know what I'm saying, but an outward focus is doing something beyond your own selves, not just beyond the walls, but beyond your own selves and fostering I hesitate to use the word force, but I, I don't know of really a better word. Fostering forces a church to look beyond itself. And I, I will tell you this, Sam's church at the time they began fostering was going through a pretty intense conflict that was causing the church to turn away from health. They had some very toxic members in the church that were finally raising their heads about change that had taken place. And that he, he will tell you the timing from his perspective could not have been worse. He said, we needed to get healthy before we did it. And guess what? They got healthy by doing it. I had a question. I don't want to take it too far away from the conversation, but it, since you're here, we'd love that. Uh, tap into your mind a little bit. Um, we're heading into summertime, right? And traditionally, there's been a summer slump, not a summer bump in most ministries. And um, coming out of COVID, um, internally at Southern Hills in Las Vegas, we were calling it the summer of vacation because everybody's telling us they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone. Everybody heading out, uh, traveling for the first time maybe for a while. With all that being stated, is there anything that, that you're seeing some healthy churches do or maybe you would suggest to us in preparation for this unique summer and the opportunity of a good harvest in the fall? Anything that we should be thinking through now in the month of May? as we're heading into this unique summer and then the fall of 2022, and that would gear our minds toward um, healthy church attendance or a healthy church as a whole. I'll give you two couple of practices, Josh, that I'm seeing, and you would, since I've worked with Southern Hills, you would anticipate that I would, I would say the first one for sure. And uh, if, if groups, whether they're Sunday school classes, home groups, cell groups, small groups, whatever the group name is, if groups uh, are not meeting, if, if there is some way that they can maintain some type of contact with each other, if they are meeting and can uh, bring people in even uh, via Zoom or some other method, here's what we have found. The absence of meeting together during COVID was least harmful for the churches where groups were meeting virtually. And so one of the things I could say, is there any way for these groups to stay somehow connected, even if people are going to be gone? 
uh, you know, is it a 10 minute, hey, let's all get together on a Wednesday night at nine o'clock or something like that so that we can just stay in touch with each other. So the glue that holds many churches together is groups. And uh, y'all may have heard me say this stat, uh, but it's worth repeating. Um, somebody who is in a group is five times more likely to stay with the church than someone who's in worship alone. So groups are really the sticky factor, the, the glue that, that takes place. The second thing that we're seeing as a practice, uh, kind of anticipation of the summer, but also as a reflection of just what happened through COVID, is uh, keeping the prayer ministries vibrant and alive and staying connected with people since we have all the digital means to do so. Keep as, it, as, as we're putting the prayer needs, and it's not just the physical needs, it's inclusive of that, but all the prayer needs before people. And then third thing is if you have a major evangelistic or outward focused thing planned for the fall, start building up anticipation for that during the summer. Let people know that even if, if a lot of people are gone, that uh, the summer, hey, we plan to have a, far, a harvest time, an outward focus time. Those are three of the practices that I'm hearing right now. Excellent. Hey, Tom, Excellent. those are great things. Um, hey, what if there's a guy on here right now that is pastoring a church and he needs to maybe consider being fostered? We we're talking a lot about fostering churches, but maybe there's a guy or two that need help. What, what are some things he needs to be looking at to consider that? And how can he approach that and get his church back into a healthy place so he doesn't have to eventually look at adoption uh, his church with another church? Well, the first thing it takes is a major dose of humility because uh, many of us who lead, many of you who lead churches and others who lead organizations, um, we, we, we like to be on the proactive helping in instead of on the reactive receiving help in. And so the first thing is, is just an admission that you, that, hey, we really, really need help. The second thing is for that person to find someone in the area, and in the area is important, whatever the area may be defined, but if a church is going to help another church, they need to be, have some geographical proximity to each other. And if that pastor knows another pastor that they feel, okay, I think he will understand me. I think he will, he will get it. Then that pastor, the one that is seeking to be fostered, sets up the relationships that I mentioned the other way where the healthy church pastor was initiating it. Now it becomes the less healthy church pastor is initiating the relationship. Again, coffee, meals, whatever the case may be. I will say that word again and again in the context of adoption, fostering. It's relationships, it's relationships, it's relationships. And there's no magic formula outside of that. Building those relationships, is that as practical as um, like put it in your monthly calendar to schedule a, 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 uh, a meal, a lunch where you're inviting pastor out? Like how, would, how do you go about, I mean, if you're a pastor, like a lot of us, you move into a community. I've been here my whole life, but if you move into a community for two or three years, how do you intentionally build those relationships practically calling up a pastor out of the blue? Well, well, first of all, Josh, you, you, you uh, just revealed your type A personality uh, by, by, by saying, put it on the calendar, but I'm the same way. Uh, I have to be highly intentional. I have to be highly intentional about sharing my faith because first of all, I'm an introvert. Uh, I, I wear, I have a t-shirt that I wear sometime uh, that uh, has a cactus on it. And it says, uh, I do not hug. I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just a total, I'm a total introvert. And so I have to be highly intentional about almost anything that I do. And yes, you would have to be highly intentional about reaching out to another church pastor, not with the idea of saying, hey, I hear your church stinks and I'm here to help you, but just to build up a relationship. Here's, here's some things about it. Uh, many of these pastors who, who are intentional about reaching out and putting on a calendar, I'm going to take you to coffee or whatever they began to learn things from that church. And even though they thought they were the, the one helping, they began to learn things as well. It's a very healthy thing for you to reach out, but yes, it requires a whole lot of intentionality to do things. And with our calendars as booked as they are, it seems like it's just one more thing. But look, we aren't just pastoring a church, we're pastors in a community. 
and everything we can do to help other pastors in the community makes our mission feel better for the glory of God. Great. Another question? Any, anyone else have something they want to ask? Uh, this is uh, Tim in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, Dr. Rayner, uh, how much money would tend to be involved in uh, fostering? And then secondly, uh, what practically do you do in fostering besides encouragement and relationship? Like how do you practically help that church? Uh, the, Tim, the, the financial commitment is a big, it depends. Um, it, your your fat financial commitment could be zero and they, they need a worship leader and you have someone that has some musical and worship leadership ability in your church and you send that person for a, a season. It could be that they have no children in the church and they want to do a backyard Bible club or a vacation Bible school and you send a, ten, a team of people for a season and then do follow up. In that sense, the financial investment is, could be zero. Sometimes the investment is of the facilities, and that is a way sometimes to get your foot in the door, and that is uh, uh, the, the, the church has, has um, all kind of deferred maintenance, and some of the facilities may, may even be in danger of something happening to them, and that would require an investment. I will say this. I know a church in Cincinnati that is doing this both for churches and for, for homes, they're finding out if they have ADH or whatever the uh, disability, the, the, the right kind of ramps going to their churches. And they're offering to do that. And that gets their, their foot in the door because many of these older churches do not. So the investment depends upon how the help is going to take place. And you will, again, you don't have to assume that it's going to be a large amount. Now, I know, Tim, you asked about the money amount. What was the other part of the question? Just uh, practically, what are some things you can do outside of encouraging them? Um, you know, how do you really foster them to help them to become healthy? And, and again, I think I've given you the examples with providing worship leadership, children's leadership, or children's ministry, vacation, Bible school, and the like. But here's how you'll find out. You'll ask them. You say, how can we practically help you? And if the relationship is built sufficiently, they will tell you. And you won't have to worry about doing all the objective or subjective research on that. Good. Steve Chevron, I saw your hand. You still have a question there or did that get answered? You're right. Hey, Steve, you're still muted, man. There it is. All right. It's like I've never used Zoom. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Dr. Rayner. Um, sure. I know that uh, Steve Miller had a question that was close to this, and you gave an answer about, you know, what to do, what do we try and implement, and you said that what, what their context demands. What do you think are maybe three of the top three areas of a church that need to be attacked first? Is it, if a church is dying Mostly it's a cultural issue, right? I mean, more times than not, it's a culture of a church. But how do you approach that with a pastor? And it's not just what they do, because all of us tend to do the same things. We just do it in a different manner, right? So how do we, how do we approach those cultural changes that need to be made, at least from what we see from supposedly a healthy church to an unhealthy one? The, the, the key to this is any unhealthy church or any church with lack of health, it is usually due to an inward focus. It could be conflict, which is an inward focus. It could be failure to, to know the community or reach the community. But any cultural issue, uh, you know, think about an unhealthy family, for example. Usually an unhealthy family, or let's say a marriage, you have one or both spouses who are asking, what can you do for me? instead of the healthy marriage where each spouse is saying, how can I help you grow and how can I love you more? And so in a church, if there is a cultural problem, it is due most of the time, maybe close to all the time, to an inward focus. So the key is what can you do to get them outwardly focused? 
One of the resources we have at Church Answers is called Pray and Go, and it has proven to be just incredibly helpful as a simple way to get churches outside their walls. And basically, it's just walk in your neighborhood, and as you're walking, pray for, pray for the people in the home that you're walking by and leave a door hanger that says, we prayed for you, and uh, uh, here's our address and website if we can do anything for you, not even knocking on a door. We've seen churches that have had transformation just because of that, pray, just, just simply getting out and praying for homes as they walk. It's getting them outside of their holy huddle and getting them from the inward focus to the outward focus. And so I would, I think I'm going to state unequivocally that most problems of culture can be identified to an inward focus. Good question. We've got time for about one, maybe two more. If anyone's got something lingering, um, Morris added to the chat, the I am a uh, discovering church membership, the difference, um, I am a church member. Uh, any other resources you would recommend, Dr. Rayner? You mentioned Sam's book. What was the title of that one? Funny you should mention it. The Church Revitalization Checklist by Sam Rayner. Um, any other resources other than that and the website? And you said the demographics report, Know Your Community Report. That's available on mm -hmm. Church Answers. Is that right? It is. And um, I, I think you can go to knowyourchurch.com. Somebody can check me on that. I think we have that URL. Uh, and then I also mentioned our resource called Pray and Go. And I, I think it's uh, prayandgochurch.com, or you can go to the Church Answer site, but I think it's prayandgochurch.com. Great. Any other questions? Oh, those, those, are, those are three of them. Walter? Yeah, I have a question. Um, something that I've heard a lot in my area, um, I've talked about the 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 five percent that are antagonistic towards the gospel and i really push towards evangelism in our church and a lot i've heard a lot of towards that they say well that that's includes the south where or that includes other parts of the country and in 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 where we're at in the new york city metro area it's that made that may be a different side do you know anything about as far as that statistic, is that like a nationwide or is that like an average? The original study, it's been a longitudinal study. Notice how I have all my books ready. Started off many years ago with a, with a um, study called the Unchurch Next Door. And the thing that we did is we sent our research team across the nation. We sent them to the Northeast. We sent them to the Northwest. And we did this study without geographical bias. There is a geographical bias when you're talking about church receptivity. We found no geographical bias with gospel receptivity. So in other words, someone in Birmingham, Alabama, you're going to have that same percentage or a similar percentage as you would in Augusta, Maine, and, and our New York City, if you wanna go with a metropolitan uh, area. So, receptivity to the gospel did not have a geographical bias. Most people think of who attends church. And so that's receptivity to attending church, which is another issue into itself. But receptivity to the gospel did not have a significant geographical bias. As a matter of fact, we found some people in the deep South who were so convinced that they were saved even when they were lost, they were more resistant to the gospel than some of the other people. Hmm. We've got some resources that have been added to the chat. Check those out. Maybe you got time for one more question. Anyone else want to close us out with a final, final question for Dr. Rayner? Yes, yeah, Steve. Okay, good. I was hoping. Um, so Dr. Dr. Rayner, I have a question. When it comes to fostering, building relationships, you're in a fostering relationship with a church. My question is, when do you stop fostering them and when or if do you have the conversation with that pastor that might lead to adoption? Um, yeah, that would be my question. Uh, Steve, you go into the relationship with a predetermined expiration date. That can always change. But if you don't decide on it on the front end, you're going to end up with scope creep and you're going to end up with dependence. So you go in with a predetermined date. 
Uh, again, spirit can lead differently once you get into it, but that has to be done. And I would recommend nothing more than a year, maybe even shorter. And, so, and you tell them the purpose of this is we want to help for this length of time. And we hope that you will be on your own. Then the idea of when, at what point does this become potentially an adoption? That's a question that is not answerable, but it always becomes answerable once you get going in the fostering relationship. One of two things is going to happen. One of three things is going to happen. You're going to leave, or you're, the health church is going to leave, and the church is going to go back the way it was. That happens, and it begins to climb. You're going to leave, and the church is going to take everything they learned and become healthier. Or you're not going to leave and you're going to come together. You will know which of those three are most likely to happen, usually within the first three months. And so you don't need to, you don't need to have Rainer or somebody who thinks they have answers tell you exactly when it's going to happen. You will know, just like the South Side story. They came to him. Excellent. Hey, Dr. Rainer, I really appreciate your time, just taking time to be with us today, sure. to hear your heart, answer our questions. We really appreciate that. I think we've already got you scheduled to come back later this year, and we're going to be looking forward to that. But I want to be respectful of your time today. I know you've got some uh, another call to be on here in a few minutes, but just from our perspective, thank you so much for pouring into our lives and ministries today. Really appreciate oh, you being with us. Absolutely. Josh gave me permission to tell you all about one thing as I leave. Uh, our organization is offering certification in ministry. Some of you have Bible college degrees, maybe seminary degrees. That is good. But as you, as you raise up other people or as uh, you begin to see the, the need for more compressed ministry training and education, we are offering a certification, which is a really, really a, just another form of a degree or, or something similar to prepare people for ministry. And it'll take six to nine months. The cost is so much less. I mean, all 10 courses are $1,900 and a complete certification. We see that as the future of many people, not everybody. It's not to eliminate Bible colleges or seminaries. So uh, you can check it out. You can go to churchanswers.university and check that out and uh, see. We will launch that in August 1. So if you have any interest, we'd love to have you. Awesome. Thanks again for being with us today, Dr. Rayner. Before I kick it over to Josh Tice to close us out today, uh, I did want to let you know what we've got coming up next week. We have president of ABWE, Paul Davis, is going to be with us next week. You will not want to miss Paul with the talk that he's got for us. Really good discussion today. Appreciate Dr. Rayner being with us. Check out those resources that he mentioned. I'm going to turn it over to President Josh Tice to close us out today. Your Excellency. I just want to mention Adam Bray. Guys, this is a really incredible post. I know some of you already saw it in the uh, private Facebook group for official members, but Adam has been working toward this senior pastor position for many years, and over the last couple of months, it was really touch and go whether or not this church in Georgia would be receptive to him as the pastor. And as you know, if you saw the post, he just got voted in this last week. So this is a huge thing, and I just want to encourage those of you who know him, uh, obviously, I've already probably congratulated him. If you don't, could you go on either the post or text him personally and just let him know um, how, how excited we are for him? But really, not just excited for him and his family, excited for this church. The fact that this church is going to get a minister like Adam behind the pulpit and in the leadership role at that church, it's going to be exciting for them. So we're really excited for that. And uh, excited for you, Adam, if you're watching this a little later. We know he's an official member as well, and we're thankful for him and his ministry. It's good to hear from each and every one of you. If you need prayer on anything, please reach out to any of us uh, at the Idea Network within this membership group. Reach out to me personally. Let me know. Looking forward to seeing a lot of you coming up here in, uh, boy, now it's, what, six, seven months away, coming up at the end of January in Dallas, Texas excited about that as well. Thank you so much. We're going to let you have a few minutes early and thank you again, uh, Jason, for hosting us today. Bye guys. Have a good week.